Uh, well, good morning. Thanks for joining us here. If you're joining us online, we're excited to have you guys here as well. Tune in that way. My name is Robert. I'm the family pastor, and uh, I'm excited to be with you guys here. And as we get started, I've got a question for you. How many of you have ever been in the midst of something important and gotten interrupted? Okay. All the parents in the room were like the first to, to raise their hands, like feel like parenting is just living in a constant state of interruption. But uh, let's caveat that a bit more. So how many of you have been in the midst of something important and got interrupted and the interruption actually turned out to be more important than the original thing you were doing? Yeah, and, and so sometimes this is little things, but sometimes they're more significant. And um, we're going to see some interruptions today as we look at the book of, uh, of Luke, chapter 8. We're continuing in our study of impossible. But, but I experienced this interruption reality uh, this last week. Uh, earlier this week, I was in the front office of the church. Uh, I was working on getting some stuff printed, which if you're like me, I, I have bad luck with printers. Like if it can go wrong with a printer, it will. Uh, in fact, your sermon notes say, Hebrews 12 for some reason. It's actually Luke 8. We'll blame it on the printers and just move on. But, but I'm in there trying to get some stuff printed for our youth group, trying to get some flyers printed. And you, normally if I'm in the office and the phone rings, I'll, I'll grab the phone, help out, answer questions and stuff. But in this particular day, I'm sitting there. It's not printing. It's not working. The phone rings. It's late in the afternoon. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to answer it. I got to get this done. I got to get this figured out. Either someone else can answer it or it'll go to voicemail and we'll figure it out later. You can already tell where the story is going, right? Um, and, and so the phone rings a few more times. One of our admin people, uh, she walks in the office and uh, picks up the phone, talks to this person for a little bit. Maybe it's one of you. I don't actually know who it was. But, but hangs up and she turns to me and she's like, well, that's a cool way to end the day. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah? What, what, why is that? What happened? And she said, oh, this person wanted to sign up to get baptized and wanted to take our intro class and find out more information about the church. And on the outside, I went, oh, that's great. And on the inside, I'm like, wow, Robert you're a doofus because you're, you're a doofus. I had maybe other words in my head or that I called myself, but, but I'm sitting there and I felt like a heel because I understood the reality of what just happened. I, I didn't see the opportunity to have a great conversation with someone and to help them take some steps in their journey of faith. Because I think any day of the week, I would say that talking to someone about baptism and getting connected to Calvary is way more important than beating a printer into submission. But in that moment, I saw it as an interruption. I saw it as an interruption instead of an opportunity to do something helpful and meaningful in someone's life. And it's, that's not the only time. I wish I could say that's the only time that I've seen a moment like that as an interruption and deprioritize it. But the fact is that happens so often in my life where something happens different than what my agenda or schedule was, and I see it as an interruption, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just not that interested. And today we're going to see in the life of Jesus, he faces several interruptions in the course of his day as he's going about what he was doing. And the amazing thing is that he didn't respond like me. That's the first amazing thing. But we're going to see some, some impossible things happen because of how he handled these interruptions. But let's catch us up to speed a little bit. So we're in Luke chapter 8. I mentioned that our, our kind of order of these sermons got shuffled a little bit the last couple of weeks. So let's catch up. Um, so earlier in Luke chapter 8, Jesus is with the disciples on the boat in the Sea of Galilee. Storm is going nuts. It says the, the wind and the waves are raging. The disciples are freaking out. They think they're going to die, and Jesus is sleeping, which I wish I could nap like Jesus. That's amazing. But, but Jesus is there napping on the boat, and the disciples wake him up, and they go, Master, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus gets up, and he rebukes the wind and the waves, like just literally like yells at the wind and the waves, like stop it. He, he didn't. He said, peace be still. He's nicer than me. But but he, he rebukes the wind and the waves, and it's still, and the disciples freak out. They're like, who is this that the wind and the waves obey the voice? Well, it's, it's the creator, it's the master, it's the Lord of everything. So they get to the other side of where they were going. They land on the shore, and, and they get there, and they meet this guy. And I really wish they'd make a kid's movie about this, but I know why they won't. So they meet this guy. He's in the area of the Gerasenes, and the guy's naked and chained up in a graveyard and demon-possessed and freaking out, and everyone in town scared of this guy. So Jesus naturally starts a conversation with them. 
And, and, and he asks his name, and the demons speaking on behalf of the man say, my name is Legion, for there are many of us. There's thousands of demons inhabiting this poor guy. And, and Jesus does the impossible. He casts the demons out. The guy is healed. He's in his right mind, and he has clothes on now, it says. And the whole town is freaked out. They're like, wait, this Jesus guy just did this. And Jesus tells this man to go and tell the whole community what happened and what Jesus had done for him. So they get back in the boat. They go back over to the area, the, the Jewish areas, and, and Jesus gets there. And we, we're not told what his agenda is. We're not told what his schedule and what he's doing, but he faces some interruptions there, and there's crowds all around him pushing in on him. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at. So let's pick up Luke chapter 8. We're going to be down in verse 40, um, and it says this. It says, Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there was a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Well, Jesus gets an interruption there. So we're going to interrupt the story and kind of explore this for a second. So Jesus is there, crowds all around him, and this guy Jairus comes and implores him. He somehow gets Jesus' attention. He's fallen before his feet and says, you got to come help my daughter. Now, this doesn't seem all that unusual to us. There's plenty of people throughout the Gospels that, that come to Jesus and say, hey, heal my friend, my family, heal me. That's a very common thing that we see. But there's something significant in who Jairus was. See, we're told that he's a ruler of the synagogues. Now, an interesting thing here is we're in Luke chapter 8. There's 24 chapters of Luke. So we're pretty early on in the, the life and ministry of Jesus. However, Jesus had already faced significant opposition and pushback from the religious leaders. They had already started to talk about killing Jesus before this happens. They said, this guy is saying that God is his father, we need to get rid of him. They had already publicly condemned and criticized Jesus' teaching in front of everyone. They had already criticized Jesus and his disciples and their spiritual habits and how they were operating there was already a ton of opposition between Jesus and the religious leaders because the religious leaders had labeled him a heretic, had labeled him dangerous, had labeled him a liar. But here's Jairus, a religious leader. He's a ruler of the synagogue, and he is here doing something you would not expect from a religious leader. See, he's standing in the gap between what his colleagues believed about who Jesus was and actually who Jesus was, and he's going... I think there's something else here. Now, this is significant because he had all kinds of people around him influencing, speaking into who Jesus was claiming to be and, and analyzing this. And here's Jairus living different than everyone around him. So I've got a couple questions for us to start with. And if you're familiar with Calvary, you're like, no, you're supposed to give me the points and the questions are at the end. That's how we do things. Well, Chad and Joe are both gone, so I'm going to do things how I want to this morning. <laughs> but, but I've got two questions that, that I hope kind of poke at, at where you're at spiritually this morning. And the first is this, are you willing to believe and live different than those around you? Are you willing to believe and to live different than those around you? See, I hope that you're surrounded by people who love and follow Jesus and honor him and are striving to, to bring glory and honor to God in their, in their life. But if you're like me, there's people around you that don't. And maybe even more so than me, you're surrounded by people who, who are really not interested in God. And maybe they're passive about it. Maybe they're like, you know, religion's just not my thing. Or maybe they're antagonistic. Maybe they're, they're poking questions that are rhetorical questions they don't really want answers to. They're poking fun. They're, they're, they're trying to, to, to criticize and to drive into you. Are you willing to believe and live different than them? Because that's exactly what Jarius did. He was surrounded by an entire think tank and echo chamber of religious leaders that all said Jesus was a heretic and needed to be killed and gotten rid of. And he went, you know, I don't think that's actually the case. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But the significant thing wasn't just that he believed, because if we're honest, it's easy to believe different than our friends. The hard thing is living different than them. And Jairus took that belief and turned it into action. He went before Jesus, before the crowds. He went in public. You know, it wasn't like Nicodemus who went in the, the middle of the night and was like hiding and trying to keep it a secret. Jairus is there out in the open in front of everyone saying, hey, Jesus, I need your help. 
So will you believe different? Will you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world, that He's your Messiah, but then will you live different as well? Because the, the, the truth is that if we're followers of Jesus, if we say we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, He's calling us to live for Him. Change is one of our, our four core values here at Calvary because we believe it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same, to stay where you are. So, so will you believe and live different? Because if you do, if you combine that belief with the action, you can see amazing things happen in your life. So let's get back to the story, though, because there was an interruption that happened with Jairus coming before Jesus and, and petitioning him. But then there's actually another interruption. So let's pick up uh, second half of verse 42. We can't even get through a whole verse without an interruption. It's going to be the theme of this morning. So the last part of verse 42 says this. It says, as Jesus went, people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. See, here's, here's the interesting thing about this. In the middle of the chaos of this moment, we're not told how many people are there, but people are pressing in around them. They are not social distancing in this day at all. People are pressing in. They're, 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 they're fighting to, to get Jesus' attention. And there's this woman there that, that was actually hoping to not cause an interruption, but she did. And, and what's interesting is when we first look at this, these stories seem to be completely different, completely unrelated, completely disconnected from each other. But yet Luke is, is very detail-oriented. Uh, when you read the, the writings of Luke, it, 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 he's a medical doctor, physician, so he's very analytical, very detail-oriented. He's always bringing in dates and stuff. In fact, I was reading through Acts right now, just my personal study, and, and there's a portion where Luke starts to kind of influence the writing, and all of a sudden we get details that never showed up before in the book uh, the, of that. But in, in, in this section here, he's bringing out details here, and he says that Jairus' daughter is how old? She's 12. And, and the, that detail doesn't really need to be in there, except for the fact that the woman is brought here into the story, and Luke tells us how long she had been suffering with this illness, and that was 12 years. And, and you begin to look at just the parallels of these things, and I don't think that there's, you know, anything we need to, to really, like, get conspiracy theory or anything here, but just the parallels of what these two women at completely different stages of life were dealing with. See, both of them were sick and missing out on things. The girl, she's 12 years old. She should be out, you know, playing. She should be out socializing. She should be at that age in the Jewish culture talking about, you know, future marriage and stuff like that, which is crazy for me. But she, she should be looking forward to the exciting new developments in her life, but she's laying there in bed sick and dying. The woman for the last 12 years has been sick because of her issue of bleeding, she's ceremoniously unclean by the Jewish law, which means she's excluded from pretty much every social activity. She can't go and worship. She can't go and socialize and hang out with people. She shouldn't have even been in this crowd if she's following the laws, which is probably why she was trying to get in and get out without anyone seeing her. These, these women are both isolated, both alone, both withdrawn from what's going on. The little girl is wondering if she'd be able to marry and start a family one day, if that would be something that, you know, her dreams would be realized in that. And we're not told anything about this woman's background, but there's no one there with her. You kind of get this impression that maybe she's single, maybe she hasn't married and had children, or maybe, even more sadly, maybe she did have a husband and a family, and they're estranged now because of this. And she's wondering, what will happen? Will I be able to start a family? Or will I be able to get my family back? 
both of these women are, are wondering what could be or what could have been of their life. The girl's wondering, what could be of my life if I wasn't laying here sick and dying in bed? What could be of my future adult life? And the woman is wondering what could have been of the last 12 years had she not been suffering with this illness. They're both facing an incredible amount of anxiety over the physical ailments that they're facing. But notice that both of those anxieties are brought before Jesus as the only option to bring resolution. Both of these, the girl indirectly, she's sick and dying in bed, so she can't do it. But the woman, these, these issues are both brought before Jesus and said, we need your help. So my second question for you today is, will you bring your anxieties to Jesus? The things that, that, that haunt you, the things that worry you, the things that make it difficult for you to sleep, the things that cause you stress, the things that you know what it is that causes your blood pressure to go up when you think about it. Will you bring those anxieties to Jesus? Because this woman here, she, she kind of makes it known through what, the details we get in the story. Jesus was her only option. She had exhausted every other option. It says for 12 years she spent all her fortune on doctors and options, and, and she was out. She was out of options, out of hope, out of, out of opportunities to bring about change. But she brought that to Jesus. She reached out literally in faith. Think about the faith that she had. The faith to say, I don't even need a conversation with Jesus. I don't need him to touch and pray over me. I don't need him to do that whole spit in the mud, make some mud, put it on my eyes thing that he does. Like, I just need to touch the edge of his robe. When we talk about believing and living differently, she believed a radical faith. She had, she had exhausted all avenues of hope, but she hears about this Jesus guy and she believes. But then she lives that out. She brings her anxiety, her worry, her problems to Jesus and literally puts it at his feet, but, but reaches out and says, I believe that you can do this, and the result is immediate healing. It's immediate. It's not that she goes home and it, it, it he, you know, slowly resolves itself. It's, it's an immediate resolution to her problem. But but what I love about this is Jesus, in the midst of this crazy moment, anti-social distancing, everyone pushing in, and Jesus goes, wait, who touched me? And Peter, being the guy that talks and then thinks, kind of like me, uh, goes, Jesus, what are you talking about? Everyone's touching you. Is basically what he's saying. Like, everyone's pressing in you. Come on, Jesus, what are you talking about? But he goes, no, there's, there's something important that's happened here. He says, my power has gone out for me. It shows the power of Jesus that without even his, like, you know, intentional involvement brings healing to this woman's life, but also the power to know the difference between a bump of a crowd and a touch of faith from this woman. And there's immediate healing that happens, but what happens next, I think, is just as important. Because Jesus could have just kind of acknowledged what happened. He's omniscient. He knows who the woman actually was, but he calls her back because I think he knew that the healing was actually not quite finished. Because he calls back for uh, basically a conversation with this woman, and, and she comes and tells everyone, you know, what happened and why she was doing this, and Jesus addresses her. And before, I, I've read this before, and before I started studying for this message, I never caught this detail before, but in verse 48, it says, and Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And I was reading something, and I started to, to chase the rabbit trail, and I could not find another instance in the Gospels where Jesus addresses someone as daughter outside of where this story is told. The only time Jesus calls someone daughter is this woman right here, because I think Jesus knew that it wasn't just physical healing that this woman needed, but that there was some emotional and mental healing and some spiritual healing that needed to happen too. There was anxiety that this woman was carrying, and she needed the love and compassion of a father in her life. She needed a heavenly father to say, hey, it's going to be okay. I'm going to calm your worries and your anxieties. And her faith is exactly what brought that to bear in her life. And so Jesus is saying there, she, he calls her daughter, but he says, you know, there, your faith has resulted in peace. So if she is, is sick and, and ill and anxious about that, she now has healing, but also peace. 
if she's worried and anxious about her family situation, her husband and child situation, Jesus is saying, you now have peace. If she's stressed about the social reality that she's been living in and how people have labeled her and outcast her, she's anxious about, will I ever have community and friends again? Jesus says, through me, you now have peace. If she's worried about her finances and how she's going to continue to pay the bills after spending her fortune on doctors, and she's worried and anxious about that, Jesus says, through me, you now have peace. She was broken. She was incomplete, but Jesus made her whole. And the truth is today, for each one of us, Jesus can make you whole. The truth that that we're all living in is that, that Jesus can make you whole. Many of us spend our life looking for things to, to, to fill us with meaning, to, to kind of fill that void of, of meaningfulness and belonging and completion. You see it so easily. People chase after their careers and their jobs to find completion there. They chase after relationships and, and, and finding meaningfulness there. They chase after possessions and status and success and accolades. They chase after uh, affirmation and approval from people. And so often people find themselves singing that song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Because the truth is that we all need to know and be known by our Heavenly Father and have Him call us son and daughter. See, 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. So today, if you're here and you've never professed Jesus as your, as your Savior, you've never called out to Him as your Heavenly Father, let me encourage you to take that step today. We're going to have members of our prayer team down here across the front of the stage after service. They'd love to talk and pray with you, help you take those next steps. If you're watching online, we encourage you to take that next step there as well. You can go to calvarylhc.com slash next and just walk through what are the next steps in order for me to, to live out my faith and make that next step. You can message us, and we'd love to to help you and and set up an appointment with one of our pastors or whatever we need to do. But will you take that step of, of allowing Jesus to make you whole? Because everything else will fall short of that total completion. This woman experienced her anxieties wouldn't resolve, her meaningfulness wouldn't show up until it was Jesus speaking into her life. And when her belief and her actions connected, and she lived out that belief, Jesus showed up in her life and and showed up in a really meaningful way. But that's not the end of the story. If you're familiar with the story, or even just remember from the beginning of this message, there's actually something else going on here that hasn't quite been resolved. What about Jairus' daughter? And some of you are like, yeah, but what about the daughter? We'll get there. So Jesus is addressing the woman that had been healed. Verse 49, it says, while he was still speaking, this poor guy literally cannot get away from interruptions. He's talking to the woman, and it says, while he's still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. What kind of news is that for a father to get? He's, he's there desperate. He's, he's pleading. He's at the feet of Jesus, it says, pleading for him to come and heal his daughter, his only child. And the news is, your daughter is dead. Don't bother. Verse 50, but Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Let's just pause there for a second. So Jairus obviously has some faith that Jesus can do something. That's why he was there pleading with him. The disciples had seen Jesus do amazing, miraculous things, and yet they're there in the presence of the situation. The daughter and Jesus said, it's okay, she's just asleep, and the result is laughter. Like, Luke gives us a ton of details, but I'm like, Luke, I want more details. Like, who laughed? What did they say next? What was the conversation as they walked to the house? Because hear this, verse 45, or verse uh, 54, I mean, but taking her by the hand, Jesus called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. 
And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. What's that conversation like? What do the people outside that are all there mourning and weeping say when this little girl comes out and was like, can I have some Pop-Tarts? I'm hungry. Like, what's, what's the dialogue? What, what do the disciples say after they laugh at Jesus and then see Jesus raise this little girl from the dead? Like, I mean, I've said some stupid things and then regretted them, but that's like, okay, that's pretty significant. And, and Jesus does the impossible here. It is impossible. He heals this woman who had been sick for, for 12 years. No doctor can help her. Immediately, without really even any intentional action of him, heals her. This girl is dead. And Jesus shows up and is like, it's okay, guys. She's just asleep. Here, get up. It's time to eat. Does the impossible. See, Jesus showed them, but also shows us that, that Jesus can bring healing and restoration to your life. In a very practical way, Jesus brought healing in all these situations. His interruptions were responded to with mercy and kindness to these situations. He heals the woman. He heals whatever was ailing and, and causing this little girl to be sick, but then literally brings restoration. She's one of only three people that Jesus raised from the dead in all the New Testament. And she gets to be a part of that elite crowd. Her life literally was restored. Think about the restoration, even in that short time that that family experienced. Jairus is trying, as he walks back to the house, trying to process and get his mind around, what, what's it going to be like to not have a child for my daughter to be dead? And, and, and yet there's restoration that happens. Their family unit was made whole again. All those things that that girl was worrying about and anxious about, likely, all restored and made well. And the truth is that Jesus can do that in your life as well. Uh, our, our pastoral team, we've seen God's healing and restoration in our life, but we also get the awesome opportunity to hear it from you guys, to hear your stories of how God works, how He heals, how He restores things. You know, just, just a few weeks ago, we got to share a testimony video of a woman who, who talks about how all her life was just broken and needing help, and God just continued to restore thing after thing that she thought would be gone. So Jesus can heal. If, if there's, a, there's an addiction in your life that you need healing from, Jesus can bring healing. If, there, if there's something that, you know, emotional trauma or damage that you need help recovering from, Jesus can bring healing. If there's a long-term sin struggle or something you don't think you can overcome, Jesus can bring healing. If there's an estranged relationship or family situation, Jesus can bring restoration. So will you live and believe like he actually will? Will you live in a manner of saying, I believe that Jesus can do this. I believe my God is big enough to do the impossible. Because for the last eight weeks, we have seen over and over and over again, Jesus do the impossible. And, it, and so if you need a little bit more inspiration, just go back and listen to the last eight sermons and just see repeatedly Jesus do things that no one else can do. And if you think, well, he can't do that in my life, ask by what evidence you actually have that belief in your life. If, if, if all of these things are true, if nothing else, you go, okay, the only thing that I believe he actually did was rise from the grave. If he can do that, there's nothing he can't do. Jesus can bring healing and restoration to your life. But I do have to share that there may be situations where Jesus chooses not to do the impossible in an area of your life. There may be an area where, where God chooses not to heal, to not bring restoration. And the reason I say that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us about an area of his life. He calls it the thorn in his flesh, and he doesn't ever give us details on what it is. If it's a physical ailment, if it's a, a, a mental or spiritual struggle that he has... But it's something that causes him a great deal of pain and anxiety and worry. And, and hear what he says in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He's like Jairus. He's pleading, please take this away from my life. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. See, at the end of the day, if we've got something in our life that needs healing and restoration and God chooses not to, to bring that into our life, 
It's likely so that we can bring Him glory and honor through that weakness, just like Paul experiences here. And so you may have an area of your life that you wish was different, that you wish God would change, that you wish God would do something about. And God may be repeatedly saying to you, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect through your weakness. Trust me, lean on me, follow me. Because oftentimes we want Jesus to fix and heal things in our life, to bring restoration so that we can continue to live on our own strength, our own power, our own sufficiencies. And sometimes God says, you know, you need to trust and follow me. And so I'm going to allow that to be there as an exercise in you leaning on me, walking in faith to who I am. And in any case, Jesus does the impossible in our life whether that's by bringing healing and restoration or growing our faith in an area we never thought would be possible. So today, as we wrap up today's message, but also kind of bring to completion uh, next week this impossible study, it goes back to our first question, and that is, will you believe and live different than those around you because of who you know Jesus to be? Will you choose to, to walk in faith to who God is even if it's crazy, even if it doesn't make sense to you or the people around you, will you be like Jarius, like this woman who says, I believe and I'm going to do something that might seem crazy to the world around me? Because if you combine that belief with the action to actually live out your faith, Jesus can show up in an impossibly amazing way in your life. That's our hope and our prayer for you as you continue to walk trusting in Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the reality that, that your son Jesus can do the impossible, that he is like no other person that has ever lived because he is not just a person, but he is your son. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And God, I pray this morning that for, for those of us that are gathered here that are watching online, God, I just pray that you would help us to, to grow in our, our faith Help us to, to grow our belief in knowing that you can actually do the impossible in our life. Help us to live with that assumption and that conviction that there's nothing outside of your opportunity or grasp to work. And then help us, like these individuals, to live that out, to actually take action in our faith. Whatever that next step is, if that's following you for the first time or if that's just walking in obedience to your commands, God, we just ask for your help because we know that, that you are amazing. You are worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our devotion and following. So help us this morning to just grow and walking in faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.